Well, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and to talk to you today. And uh, speaking to young people is one of the, the real privileges that I have because it's out there that in the, these folks that are here today, each one of you that holds the, the future of, our, uh, of your country and not only your country, but uh, what the human race will be doing um, in 15, 20, 30 years from now, a large part depends upon the generation that is uh, of your age right now. So it's a real honor and pleasure to be here talking to you. One, one thing is I, I'm gonna talk about a kind of a wide variety of subjects and I hope that I keep your interest and uh, we will leave time at the end for any questions that you have. But one of the things that uh, I'd like you to take away from this is that you can do whatever is important in your life. If you really want it, uh, if you really think it's a desirable goal, and you work hard enough for it, you can achieve it. That's the great thing about living in, uh, in America where I grew up, but also in the United Kingdom where you are, that opportunities abound and that there are opportunities to do whatever you want. It doesn't, if you, don't, if you want to be an astronaut, that's something that I think that uh, the future will hold opportunities for if you want to be whatever profession, whatever kind of uh, goal that you have, whatever your dream is, that if you work hard and you really want it enough, that with perseverance you can achieve that. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I'm doing today. Uh, and as, as with a kind introduction, um, you were told a little bit about uh, some of uh, the things that I've done in my life. And I, I kind of want to tell you a little bit of story about uh, what I'm doing, a little bit about space, uh, the things that I'm doing now. Well, where am I today? Today I'm a, a professor of uh, internal medicine and pediatrics at the Baylor College of Medicine, which is in Houston, Texas. I've spent a lot of years in, in Houston. Uh, I first came to Houston in 1980 as part, uh, to join NASA and be, become an astronaut, but uh, I've, I've stayed on there, went to medical school there, did four years of medical school, four years of residency, and I've been a professor at the school for about 12 years. And I spend most of my, my days, um, most of my time, and uh, this is how I make a living, is working at the world's largest medical center, which is the Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas. It, there's a, about 15 di uh, different large hospitals that are there, two medical schools, school pharmacy, et cetera. But where I spend most of my time is at this hospital. Um, it's called Ben Taub General Hospital. And it's a rather unique facility. It's one in which it's really a, a global uh, institution in the sense that people from all over the world, mostly poor, uh, people that are uninsured in the area of, of Texas that I live in, come, come here to get care. And so we see a wide variety of, of health problems, much like you would see in, uh, in the developing world. In addition, uh, we provide care to immigrants that are even undocumented or illegally in the United States and uh, we provide services such as dialysis for uh, people with uh, kidney failure. And so this is how I, I spend most of my day is uh, working in the various departments at this hospital, uh, teaching residents and students and also providing medical care. When I'm not working uh, in the hospital, every opportunity I get, I will um, go to countries around the world and do research, volunteer work, education projects. Um, this, this is uh, every, every year I go to um, Southeast Asia, usually in December, and uh, this is a picture of a project we did in Cambodia last year. Um, I also have worked in uh, many refugee camps around the world. This is refugee camp along the uh, border of Thailand and Burma or Myanmar. Uh, where there's a lot of refugees from uh, the country of Myanmar that, uh, from fighting that's gone along the, along the border. Um, I also do a lot of disaster relief work. Uh, this is a picture of uh, me working uh, shortly after the earthquake in Haiti uh, with, a, uh, with a family. 
this is uh, work in Central America. Um, if you live in Texas, uh, particularly the part of Texas I live in, um, about 60 or 70 percent of the population that I deal with uh, are Spanish speaking only. So um, it, it's something that you have to speak Spanish in order to, pr to practice medicine in, in uh, southern Texas. And so I do a lot of volunteer work in Central and South America. This is uh, a little project we were doing in the country of El Salvador. Um, I also uh, have done a lot of uh, disaster relief work. Um, here is uh, a picture of me working in central uh, Iraq with a family of, uh, uh, of children and, and women um, uh, shortly after the war started. This, I think this was in 2005. Um, I also have done a lot of work with the United Nations in working with food fortification programs uh, in which we, uh, I, I act as an advisor and we analyze how you can add iron, zinc, and other micronutrients to uh, foods that will allow you to uh, improve the diets, improve the malnutrition of uh, uh, particularly children and young women around the world. And this was a project in Pakistan. Um, the first job I had after I, I joined the faculty at my medical school was working with uh, a, a group that specialized in HIV care, uh, AIDS, uh, and we worked in Eastern Europe, in Romania, but mostly in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where the highest rates of HIV are found in the world. And another project that I've worked with is the Coca-Cola um, company. And, which I've acted as, act as, as an advisor in um, coming up with a nutritional drink. We're all used to drinking Coca-Cola, but the, the company is also interested in developing drinks that are um, nutritionally fortified with multiple uh, vitamins and minerals to help the diets and help uh, rates of anemia for example, in young children. And so this was a project that I was doing in Botswana, uh, working with these children uh, in developing that uh, drink. And another disaster relief project that I worked on was in Sri Lanka um, after the tsunami that hit in 2004. And that's working in one of the refugee camps. So how did I get there? Well, I, I grew, how did I get to this point where I am now? I grew up in a, a uh, very, very small town in the Midwest of the United States. It was uh, a town of probably about 2,000 people. It was a farming community. Um, my father was, actually grew um, crops and I would help on the farm. And when I was growing up, the space program was just getting started. This was back in the 1950s. And at the time, I thought, wow, what a wonderful thing that we're trying to do is to put men into space. But sometimes when you uh, grow, up, grow up in such a small place, you never think that you would actually have an opportunity to do so. Well, uh, I, I then went off um, to school. And I was going to, uh, I was about your age in the uh, mid, and, mid and late 1960s. And then I went to, to the university. And this is uh, me getting my wings as a Marine Corps aviator. In 1969, the Vietnam War was going on. And at that time, the United States initiate, initiated a draft, which meant that if you were 18 years or older, you could be um, uh, chosen to uh, join the military. And whether you wanted to or not, you would be put into the military. And the way that they chose individuals is that they, would, they had a big lottery, and they would reach into a bowl with the, the birth dates of everybody. Um, they'd have every, January 1st through December 31st, and they'd have a ball for every, each one. And they would pick out a ball, and then everyone with a birth date on that day would be chosen to go into the military. Well, that was the only lottery in my life that I've ever won. So I got one of the winning tickets. Uh, one of the, my birthday, January 28, was one of the first um, balls chosen. And so I knew that I was going to be going into the military. So I um, 
decided to join before I would actually get drafted and went into, chose the United States Marine Corps as my uh, choice of services. And uh, so this is a picture of me getting my, uh, my wings as a Marine Corps aviator. And um, I, I served both as an aviator and I also served as a uh, uh, aviator that served on the ground calling in airstrikes uh, for missions. Uh, this is me in the cockpit of my airplane, and this is the airplane that I flew, the A6 Intruders. Now the only place that you can find that airplane is in museums, um, and so this, I actually found one a few years ago with, um, with the, the airplane was meant to deliver um, bombs to targets, and you can see I'm uh, touching one of the bombs there. Um, and then later, uh, in my, after the, the war ended and um, uh, I had my first opportunity to, I served my first five years, six years of military service, I had the opportunity to uh, either stay in the Marine Corps or go do something else. And I'd always really had this inkling that I wanted to be a doctor. And so it was, I was kind of torn between leaving the service and becoming a doctor. But the military offered me the opportunity to go become a um, study, graduate, get a graduate degree in electrical engineering. And so um, this is me with my uh, son at the time uh, st uh, by the school that I was, I was going to called the Naval Postgraduate School in, um, in California. About the time that I finished uh, graduate school, um, the Marines sent me back to flying, but while I was, um, back serving with the Marines, NASA came out with the start of the space shuttle program. The space shuttle program was designed as a follow-on to the uh, Apollo programs, which you're probably all familiar with, that sent men to the moon. Um, after we re finished our, pro uh, our missions to the moon, and there were six uh, missions that were designed to go to the moon. After we, did, we finished that, we had a couple other projects. One was the Skylab, which was the first of the orbiting laboratories. The second program that we had was a joint mission with the Soviet Union at the time in 1975, in which we had a Soviet, astro uh, Soviet astronauts and American astronauts that joined in, in space in their two separate vehicles, in the Soyuz and in an Apollo rocket uh, joined and rendezvoused in space, and that was in 1975. And then NASA decided, what, what is it that we want to do next? And the idea was to design the space shuttle to be kind of a space transportation system, kind of like a space truck that would haul materials, men, women, into space uh, where they could perform various activities, launch satellites, um, they could uh, uh, repair satellites that uh, were disabled. Uh, various duties that would all be, would all take place in low Earth orbit as opposed to going to another planet or to the moon. So this was the idea and when the, when the space shuttle project initially started, it was thought that it would be uh, something that would would probably have 25, 30 missions each year. It was like every two weeks we were gonna have a mission. That turned out to be somewhat of a pipe dream. Uh, it turned out that we actually couldn't turn the space shuttle around that often. But um, at, at the time that the space shuttle was uh, designed and uh, implemented, they thought that we would have a lot of missions. And so they knew that we were gonna need a lot of astronauts to be on those missions. And so. Uh, when I heard about this, I had never really thought about, since I had first heard about the space, uh, space program as a young child and growing up in the Midwest, I'd really kind of put thoughts about being an astronaut aside until it came, uh, when they came out with applications, um, they said, if you think you've got the qualifications, and basically the qualifications were have a graduate degree in some sort of science um, or technology, and um, 
basically, that was the only requirement. But they said, if you'd like to apply, go ahead and apply. And I looked at what I had done. I had been an aviator and a, uh, had a graduate degree in electrical engineering. So I said, well, what the heck? I'll go ahead and give it a try. Um, it sounds like it would be a very interesting thing to do. And I did apply. And um, after about a year's worth of interviews and applications and um, various testing, um, I was finally uh, selected in 1980. Um, the first space shuttle mission was flown in April of 1981, and the last mission was just uh, completed 30 years later. Last summer was the, the very end of the space shuttle mission. Over 130 flights were flown during that period of time. Uh, two of the missions ended tragically. We'll talk a little bit about th that later. Uh, but I was very thrilled to be a part of the space shuttle program. Um, my fr first couple of years in the, in the NASA program, I basically learned about what it is to become an astronaut. What do, you, what do you have to know? And even though all of us came from various uh, scientific backgrounds and, and had different levels of knowledge about different things, um, those of us in my NASA class, which was 17 people um, that were chosen from about 5,000 applications. And we, we had a lot to learn about what it is that NASA does, what it is to be an astronaut. We were given um, lectures on topics from uh, geology to space science, astrophysics, um, engineering, pretty much everything that you needed to know on how to uh, operate a space vehicle and how to uh, operate in space, actually live in space. The first, after the first year or two of just kind of basic education, we kind of got our feet wet supporting projects for other missions. In other words, we would uh, be support crews for a, a mission going um, uh, on a space shuttle mission. Uh, we'd go to the Kennedy Space Center, for example, where the missions were launched, and we would help uh, some of the support operations there. We might be the communicator with the space shuttle and mission control, uh, various number of support tasks. I finally got my turn, and uh, I was chosen for a mission in 1984, about four years after I, was, uh, I joined the, the NASA Astronaut Corps. And this was a, a patch of my first mission. Um, the first mission was a, a secret Department of Defense mission. And so I can't tell you a whole lot about what we did on that mission, but it was uh, your first flight is always uh, probably the one that you remember the best because uh, you went into it not expecting what it was that you were going to encounter along the way. And this is a picture of our crew, all military officers. Uh, back in that time, I had a mustache, which later went away and never returned again. But at that time, I had one. Uh, and this is a picture of the first uh, space launch that I was on. When you go into space for the first time, it's kind of like, wow, what's it going to be like? You know, it's like um, you, you're looking at a, uh, a ride at, at a carnival or something. You look at this big. Um, uh, roller coaster or something that looks like it's got all these turns and flips and everything like that. And you wonder, wow, what's it going to be like before you get on? Um, and that's kind of like it was going into the, your first space mission. You've had other people that have come back and told you what it's like, um, that you'll experience this and that. And you'll say, OK, well, it sounds uh, uh, like I need to be ready for that. But when you get there for the first time, it's something that you really can't quite it's not quite what they describe to you. The way that you, uh, when you go out to a, a space shuttle mission, uh, about seven days before the flight um, actually occurs, the, before the launch date, you travel down to the um, Kennedy Space Center. In the year or so up, leading up to the mission, you've gone through in various simulators everything that you're actually going to do on a mission. Uh, if you're going to do a spacewalk, you simulate that. Um, the way that we do that is you go into a, a giant pool, swimming pool. That uh, the one, the current one that they have is about 60 feet deep, and it has the type of equipment that you'll be working on 
during the, the spacewalk, and you'll be able to actually, actually get into your spacesuit and they'll, they'll basically balance it out with air so that you're, you're neutrally buoyant. And this means that if you, you're underwater, you're neither going to sink or you're not going to come to the surface. And so it's basically like being in um, zero gravity. So it's a very good simulation of what it's like to actually do a spacewalk. During the parts, the most critical parts of the space shuttle mission, which are the launch into space and the re-entry, you can, you can perform all that with all the, the uh, controls and all the software in a simulator that looks exactly like the inside of a cockpit. Um, there's even things that you do to simulate what you'll, you're going to be doing on orbit. You can simulate the experiments that you're going to do. You can actually even simulate um, and practice what it is like to go to the toilet in space, believe it or not. They actually have a simulator that uh, NASA does that has a real space toilet and you can practice uh, defecating and urinating um, while you're on the ground. And the way that they do that is they have a little uh, uh, space toilet, which I don't know if I have a picture of it here, but they, uh, they have a, a camera that looks up at you when you're sitting on the toilet. So it, it can tell you if you're, you, you centered yourself just the right way so that you, um, you, you don't cause a real mess when you go into space. And so there, there's simulators for every aspect of space. Eating, you can't really simulate sleeping in space, but um, you can simulate going to the bathroom and you can simulate um, cooking, whatever. Um, but NASA's thought of just about everything. So you've trained for this year, going up uh, for, for a year for the specifics of your mission, uh, kind of the standard parts of the mission, getting up into space and coming back. And by the time you get down to that last week, you're, you're pretty much ready uh, for the mission, as ready as you can be. The last week before the mission, you go to the, to the space center there and you practice getting in and out of the real vehicle, out of the real space vehicle, but which by now is out on the space pad, the launch pad, and uh, you practice drills of getting out of the space shuttle in case you would go out on launch day and there'd be a fire or some escape of toxic materials or something. So you actually will practice um, uh, getting out of the vehicle and you're up 150 feet above the ground and so there's actually an escape wire and a little basket that you jump in the basket and cut the, cut the attachment and you slide down a, a long wire to safety about um, two or three hundred yards away from the, where the launch pad is. So all these kind of contingencies you're, you're practicing. Um, you, the, the day of the launch you wake up maybe uh, uh, eight hours before the actual launch time, uh, eat breakfast, uh, get into your suits, and then you take a bus about three or four miles um, to where the, the, the launch pad is. And two to three hours beforehand, you get into the, into the space shuttle, and there, one by one, you're strapped into your seats, and you have to lay on your back then for the three hours before the, the liftoff. And it's quite uncomfortable, actually, if you think about laying your seats backwards and just sitting with your feet up in the air and, and most of the weight on your back and with an uncomfortable spacesuit, this, um, th this is something that makes the, the waiting a little bit more uncomfortable. And gradually the countdown uh, starts and, uh, for those two or three hours that you're there and you, you just kind of pray that there's no kind of holds or any kind of uh, problems during the, during the countdown because that could mean that you're on your back even longer. And gradually, checks will be done um, during that pre-launch period in which various uh, systems on the spacecraft will be, will be uh, completed and checked out. And then you get down to the final countdown. And you know, you get, as you get 10, 9, 8, you know, your adrenaline really starts rushing because you know things are gonna, about to happen. And about six seconds before the liftoff, the 
uh, the main end, there's several types of engines on, the, on this space shuttle. There's three what we call main engines, which are liquid fueled by, um, that's the enormous tank. I guess I don't have a, a model here to show you, but there's an enormous tank of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Um, and the, that's the fuel that powers these engines. And then there are two solid rocket boosters, which are on either side of the tank. And th those provide the majority of the power during the, the first stage. Uh, each of them has about 2,500,000 pounds of thrust for a total of about 5 million pounds of thrust. And then each of the main engines each have about uh, 500,000 uh, pounds of thrust. And so you have approximately 6,500,000 uh, pounds of total thrust and, the, and the, the whole stack of the space shuttle and the fuel weighs a little bit over five million. So you have a more thrust than you have weight, and so you're actually going to uh, take off and go into space. At the time of lift, uh, so six seconds before the, the actual liftoff, these main engines fire, and they're, so you, you don't actually take off at that time, but they're testing them out. And so you, you hear, hear this roar and this rumble underneath you. And then as you get down to five, four, three, two, one, uh, at zero, the solid rockets fire. Um, they're, you're held down onto the launch pad by four bolts on each of the solid rocket boosters. Those bolts blow, the solid rockets fire, and you're on your way. And during that first two minutes of the launch, you're um, going through the atmosphere, so there's a lot, it's a very rough ride. There's a lot of vibrations, you're shaking, um, and it's hard to, even though you describe, I can describe it to you here, the, the amount of shaking and rocking and rolling that you have is, is just really incredible. There's a lot of noise in, the, in, the, uh, in your ears from all the, the power and thrust of the engines. And, uh, about two minutes into liftoff, this, this kind of shaking finally ends as you get above the atmosphere. You get to about 120,000 feet at that time above the Earth. And it, the, the ride then becomes very smooth when the, the solid rocket boosters are ejected and you continue on just the main engines. It's quite a ride. And it's, for the next six minutes, it's a very smooth ride, much more quiet but the G-forces start building up and up and up. You get to a maximum of about three Gs that is through three times the force of gravity. It's, it's through the chest and it really builds up and makes it difficult to, to breathe and to, and to talk. And at the end of eight minutes and 32 seconds, this, the, solid rock, the main engines cut off and now you're in space. And, and in that time between going uh, from liftoff to eight minutes and 32 seconds after the liftoff, you've gone from zero to 17,500 miles an hour. And it's, it's, that's a lot of acceleration, a lot of things you've gone through, and suddenly the solid rocket boosters cut off, you're in space, and you're floating. So quite a, quite a change in environments from being on the Earth, going through um, the Earth's atmosphere, in just a little bit over eight and a half minutes. And so this is a, a picture on this slide of uh, the space shuttle about uh, 30 seconds into the, into the liftoff. And you can see that there's quite a plume of smoke that's left behind by the solid rocket boosters. Uh, once we get into orbit, I think one of the, the greatest things that we, we do is just being able to look at the Earth from space. This is a picture of my hometown uh, in Houston, or where I live now, and you can see the kind of detail. If you look straight down at the Earth and you use a telephoto lens, you can see all this detail. Uh, see, do I have a? Oh, I guess I don't have a laser pointer here, but you can you can see the kind of detail. You can see roads, you can see uh, rivers, you can see airports, um, and this is my hometown of, of uh, Houston. But that first sight of the Earth from space is just, just something undescribable and something that you, you really never forget. Oops, I think, there we go. Um, so you do your activities on, 
in space. And unfortunately, I can't tell you a lot about what we did on that first one. But uh, the return to Earth is not quite as dramatic from a standpoint of, of physically being so dramatic. You have a, a long, fairly smooth 45-minute uh, uh, trip back from space to Earth once you deorbit, uh, probably more like about 60 minutes. Um, and you're, you're gradually making turns, but as you're, as you're losing speed, as you're uh, bleeding off speed, you have a lot of heat that develops uh, and what we call plasma uh, builds up around the outside of the space, spacecraft from all the heat. And it actually looks like you're on fire as you're coming back in. And looking out one of the windows overhead, you can see the, the, the blast of plasma that builds up around the, the uh, spacecraft. So that was my, my first mission was in 1985. Uh, uh, I was slated for another mission uh, to occur the following year. Uh, unfortunately, what happened was in uh, January 28th of 1986, um, uh, the Challenger accident occurred and um, seven of our friends uh, died on that mission. Um, it was a, quite a tragic uh, incident and it really caused us to go back and look at our safety of our uh, spacecraft because it was the first time that NASA in 25 years had actually lost anyone in space. Uh, we had never had loss of life of any, anyone during a space mission. We, we had lost in a fire on a ground accident um, some astronauts in uh, 1967. But this was the first time that, that we had ever had an accident in space. And so it caused us to look um, at what things had gone wrong during that mission. It, it looks like what caused the, the failure was a, uh, a fault in one of the solid rocket boosters. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be chosen for the next mission to go up after the uh, Challenger accident. Um, and it took about two and a half years before we had all the the problems fixed on the space shuttle, and it wasn't until 1988 that the next mission flew, and that, that's what uh, this one is about, um, was the, uh, what, the 26th mission of, this, of the space shuttle. And this was the, our crew from that mission. Uh, the, the crew was uh, uh, all veterans. It was the first time that everyone that was on that flight had flown a, a flight before. And for the first time, we also wore these spacesuits, which became a fixture of astronauts for the rest of the space shuttle program. It turned out that during the space uh, mission that failed the Challenger in, in 1986, that we felt that most of the crew was actually alive after the explosion occurred, and that they probably were alive all the way till the point at which they hit the water. And it was thought that if they had had some way of escaping out of the, the shuttle, that they might have survived. And so what we developed were these spacesuits. Prior to this time, what we wore was basically a, um, a, a, just a flight jacket with a, a little survival vest on it. And there was no way of actually jumping out or getting out or parachuting out of the, uh, the space shuttle if there was an accident. So, the thought was that if there was some kind of problem, you would just kind of glide back to Earth and you would land in water or on the land. But what the Challenger accident proved to us is that if there was some kind of catastrophic event like that, there would be no way for the crew to, to survive even if they were still alive. So what these suits did was allow us to uh, have a pressure uh, containing suit that would provide positive pressure to us uh, that would give oxygen to breathe. Um, the helmets allowed us a way to completely seal us off from the outside so that we could breathe oxygen. It also had a way that if we went into the water in cold weather, we would be able to survive during um, the cold temperatures of the water. We also had parachutes on our back that if we had an accident like the Challenger, we could, we could jump out 
the side hatch of, the, of what was left of the cabin, and we could parachute to Earth. So there were a lot of uses for, this, uh, for these suits. They also provided uh, G, uh, what we call G suits, or positive pressure when we're returning from, the, from being in zero gravity for uh, a period of time. And this would allow us to um, offset some of the, the G forces as we returned uh, from outer space. So these suits were uh, uh, something that uh, provided us a lot of protection, but on the other hand, you can see that they would be quite hot. And uh, when, we were, when you're sitting on the launch pad waiting to, to go up into space, they could be incredibly uncomfortable. But that was a price that you paid. And once you got up into orbit, you don't want to stay in these for days, and so you get out of them. And another problem that we found on, the first, on this first mission where we used them was that we had to find a place to stow them, and they could kind of like float around if you didn't uh, grab them and, and stow them in a, a, a location so that they wouldn't be a problem during the rest of the mission. So uh, again, I'm through, through these slides, I'm kind of showing you a picture of uh, some of the things that we could see from space. This is a picture of, uh, does anybody have an idea where this might be? Turkey. I'm sorry? Turkey. Turkey, okay, well that's, um, it, it could be, it's like a Straits, like the Dardanelles, but this is actually um, the Straits of Gibraltar. And you can see on the bottom part is Morocco and the top is Spain, and you can see the British colony of uh, Gibraltar um, there to the right. And you can also see the, the waves coming through the Straits of Gibraltar. These are actually waves um, that you can't see from the surface. And it makes a very interesting uh, observation that you can make from space. And so much so that a, a lot of the uh, naval, op, uh, the, the Navy, US Navy was very interested in having us report these waves because they're great places for submarines to hide. This is a picture of some of the deforestation that take, was taking place in the 1980s in, in South America, and this is over Brazil, where they were burning large areas of the Amazon jungle down and, and forming farms that uh, were destroying a lot of the, the jungle um, that provides new sources of new drugs, pharmaceuticals, uh, 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 destroying animal species. And so as a result of a lot of these pictures that we took showing the widespread effects of, of deforestation, uh, some of these the environmental, environmentalists have been uh, successful in slowing down the, the, the progress of destroying the environment in the Amazon basin. And of course, we have to have fun um, now and then I was going to show you a movie, but it looks like I'm, I'm being a little bit long-winded. But uh, on this mission, we were given some Hawaiian shirts by uh, one of the tracking stations um, in, in Hawaii, and they sent us these shirts. And so we wore them for the uh, uh, take a picture during the mission. And this is uh, getting back into the spacesuits. And again, you can see looking out the front part of the, the space shuttle, you can see the windows with all the, the plasma, the heat building up uh, as you re-enter the atmosphere. The three, let me just talk a little bit louder here, but these, these three screens are the computer screens that we, we use to control the, that we use to control the uh, space shuttle. They're actually very ancient computers. Um, in the space shuttle, we had the same computers that were used in the Apollo program, basically, to go to the moon that were maybe 20 years uh, earlier with just a little bit more memory. Most of your, your modern computers today, your main memory might have four or eight gigabytes of, of memory in them, uh, just your laptop computer. We were able to fly the space shuttle with 128,000 bytes of, of computer. So, I mean, this, this was like uh, 100,000 times less memory than you have now in your, your basic computers. But the problem was that once you have a system that works, trying to, to redesign it and putting it through all the testing 
means that you would have to spend an incredible amount of money to recertify uh, those computers. And so we just got along with this old technology that worked quite well, but it was old nevertheless. And this is on that mission. It was a very important mission because it meant that we had successfully got into space back after that accident that occurred three years earlier. And so um, uh, President Bush came out. Um, he was up for election that year, and it was a good opportunity for him to uh, be seen with the astronauts coming back from space. And so uh, that was President Bush meeting, it, meeting us after we returned from space. And I, I always like to show this picture because uh, getting on the cover of Time Magazine is always a, uh, something that is important for anyone to be on the cover. And so I, I like to say that if you could actually see in the very tip of that space shuttle, if you could actually look inside, you would see me on that, uh, inside the cabin. And so I can say that I've actually been on the cover of uh, Time Magazine. So uh, my third mission then was, uh, uh, another uh, secret mission. It was actually a mission for the CIA. And um, so I really can't tell you much about this one other than we flew much, we, because of the nature of the mission, we had to fly farther north and south over the, the uh, Earth than any space mission in history. So we got to see more of the, uh, of the north and southern parts of the world than anyone else has seen. And this was our, our crew, uh, all military astronauts. Um, and again, one of the great things about being in space is being able to um, take pictures of the Earth from space. This is one of the cameras that we had. It was a, um, a five inch format camera. It took wonderful pictures. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Greenland, the tip of Greenland, um, that I took it during this mission. Uh, going in this very southern part of the world, this is a picture of Antarctica, one of the uh, projections of ice uh, from the continent. And this is a picture of uh, New York City um, from space during the daytime. And you can see Long Island and Man Manhattan and the Hudson River and the ocean at the bottom. Uh, you can see th these are clouds that are kind of streaming. It was actually during February, so there's snow on the ground. And during the same mission, here is uh, the same picture taken at night. And you can see how the cities light up. Uh, that's New York City at night. And to be fair, I thought I would give you a, a picture. This is London. You can see the, the Thames River going through the picture there. This is looking straight down at London. And this is a great photo of looking at England at night. And you can see this is looking back from the, uh, from the east to the west. This is London. I think this would be Bristol over there. Here's, um, uh, would this be Birmingham here? Liverpool, Manchester. Uh, I think this is Leeds. Uh, going up to Newcastle. And then this is the Isle of Man over here in Ireland. And so you can see just uh, how much you can see from space. This is, if you look along the horizon, you look out, you'll be able to take pictures like this. And then if you look straight down and take a picture, you'll be able to take a picture like you did before, what we saw before of, of London. And this is actually the. Uh, one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world. This is Lake Baikal in, in Siberia. And it actually contains 20% of the world's fresh water is in this one lake because it's so deep. This is the uh, Isle, uh, the, the Vale of Kashmir in uh, between India and Pakistan. And on one of my medical trips some years later, I was actually able to stand in that same place that I saw from space, which was one of the really cool things about what I do now is that I'm able to actually go to many of the places that I took pictures of from space. This is the Aurora Borealis, the northern lights. Um, on this mission, because we flew so far north, it would be like we were flying right through the aurora the northern lights. And some of the 
Um, the way that the northern lights occur is that particles from the sun are uh, sent out from the sun to out, out through the solar system. And as they come through the Earth's atmosphere, they'll actually spiral down the Earth's magnetic lines and interact with the oxygen and nitrogen in the air and give off ions or, or photons that will cause the different colors, the blue and the, and the green, to appear. And it's almost like you're flying through uh, green slime or something. It was just really eerie, as you, were, uh, as you can see from this picture. Now, we recently, I think it was just this, this last week that we had a, uh, a period of very high solar activity. And so there were a lot of uh, places that would see the northern lights or the southern lights in the southern uh, hemisphere. Uh, at much lower latitudes than we normally do. And so there were some very brilliant displays of the northern lights here just in the, in the past week or two. And then uh, just to kind of wind down here, and then I think I'll leave this open for some questions, is uh, my last mission was uh, called the International Microgravity Laboratory. And you can see from that space shuttle on the patch these are all patches that we designed for our particular missions. And you can see from the, uh, from the picture of the space shuttle in the, in the back of the payload, the, where the payload bay doors are open, you'll see a, a kind of a cylinder. And that's a, that was a space laboratory that we had called the Space Lab. And this was our crew. It was, we, it was mostly designed for a scientific mission. Uh, it was a scientific mission. It was called the Intergra International Microgravity Laboratory Number 1. We had two shifts of astronauts operating. Um, so we operated 24 hours around the clock. And we, had, we did various experiments. Uh, some of them were designed for investigations of the way that uh, our physiology is different in space than it is on Earth. Um, and this was a rotating chair that looked at the balance organs inside the inner ear and how they reacted when you're in zero gravity. Another experiment that looked at um, reactions to a rotating um, umbrella and how your visual system would, would change uh, during the mission. We grew crystals of materials like gallium arsenide, which can be used in uh, high-speed computer applications. And here's, uh, in addition to the experiments, we also took some great pictures. And this is uh, a picture of the Middle East. You can see the Mediterranean Sea on the left. At the bottom of the picture, you can see the Nile River Delta. The Dead Sea, uh, that's the shuttle's tail, because we're taking a picture uh, out towards the horizon of the Earth. You can see the Dead Sea um, in the middle of the picture, uh, Israel, the Sinai Peninsula, off into Jordan and Iraq in that pe picture. And this is uh, a picture of a volcano in Indonesia called Mount Tamboro, which was uh, actually the most violent recent volcano in, in history. We, you've probably heard of the more famous volcano Krakatoa which erupted in 1883 and killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people. This, was, uh, this volcano erupted in 1816, uh, but it was many, many times more violent than the, the, the one in Krakatoa, but we, it didn't get as much publicity because it was more distant from population centers and didn't kill as many people. So that was my last shuttle mission, and um, I kind of started with what, where I've gone uh, since then, I decided that uh, after four missions, that it was time to move on and time for another career. And something that I'd always wanted to do was go into medicine. And uh, my goal was to help the people or help the countries that I've been able to see from space. I had this yearning to uh, go back to the Earth and uh, go to these countries and, and help them in whatever way I could. And so I decided that what I wanted to do was go into medicine. It was a hard uh, four years of medical school, a hard, hard four years of uh, uh, postgraduate training in my residency program, but 
Uh, it was a dream that I had, a dream that I worked uh, very hard to achieve. And now, looking back, I, I'm so glad that I uh, put that hard work into becoming a doctor uh, after my career at NASA. And uh, I, I can't uh, tell you how much it's, it, it means to me that uh, I, I achieved that and that I can do what I'm doing to now. It's, uh, right now. It's a great pr privilege and it's something that I'd like to just communicate to you as well, that if you really believe hard in something, you really worth, feel that it's a worthwhile dream, that if you, you work hard, you, you, you can do it. And I would encourage you all to live out your dreams just as I've been able to live out mine. Well, I think that round of applause says it all. One of the purposes of education is to inspire young people. Another one is to encourage them to use their talents to become good citizens and to benefit our fellow man. And I think that round of applause, David, showed our appreciation for what you have done uh, through your remarkable life, which really has, has contained the careers of several distinguished lives. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. My and pleasure. You can see we've really appreciated it. And thank you very much to the team from Liverpool John Moores University for facilitating this wonderful experience for us.